So, um, thanks for the for that talk. Really interesting and good. Um, it struck me as as you were going through the particularly the thing about the generational uh, ethos of a family being part of a larger nation and so on. That is completely alien to a modern understanding of family as you mm -hmm. it. But um, a lot of what you were talking about towards the end there um, is completely alien to the way we uh, people in general I think in society view families. Mm -hmm. Um, so just a, a practical thing. Um, you mentioned a bunch of practical measures, and I'm glad you did because you know because a lot of people wanted to hear you know how do I put this into practice. But um, so my question is, what what do you think is the main thing that militates against implementing those things in the family? So those those kind of that list of things I did at the end, yeah. I think. Um, there, you could have a whole semester on what, you know, militates against them. But I, I tend to think that the number one problem that families are dealing with is a radical individualism. Um, that's, that's kind of why I spent so much time on that part in, in the beginning, is because the, the Jewish way of understanding the family, that who I am, I can't really conceive of myself on my own. Um, and so too often the, the problems that start to, to form in a family are because I'm focusing on myself. What are my wants? What are my um, needs? Uh, what do I want? Um, uh, do I like this thing? Do I not like that thing? And then we act out of that rather than what is the what does the family need? What is the, the desires of the family? Um, um, and that kind of speaks also to that royal dimension of the family that, excuse me, you're not supposed to live out of, uh, out of your own like self-serving um, function. You're supposed to always be uh, ordered towards the rest of the family. So I actually would say that the number one problem I see that gives families the most trouble is living as if I'm an individual uh, that, that I'm part of this like team. Um, the, the family has a much more uh, organic unity to it than just a, a conglomeration of individuals that live in, under the same roof. So. Any other questions? Brian? Rich, to what extent should you alter your own immediate family's life, geography, etc to incorporate in a meaningful way your extended family? Good question. <laughs> this is going to sound like I'm punting, but it's not. That's something that you need to discern with your spouse. Um, the 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 family has an ecclesial uh, structure. And so um, we believe in the church that the Holy Spirit speaks through uh, the sacrament of holy orders to guide the church. Um, you know, we trust that if our bishops are pursuing holiness, then they're listening to the Holy Spirit and making decisions based on that. Well, the, the husband and the wife uh, have that role in their families, and so they need to be listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying and then making those decisions. Sometimes that's going to require radical change um, if you really become convinced that the Lord is calling you in a certain direction. Um, sometimes that's just going to be small change. Actually, I would probably say most of the time it's just small change. Um, you know, we live in a culture that makes it almost impossible to do what you're saying. I mean, like, one family lives in uh, California, the next family lives in Maine. Okay, where are you going to live? Well, either you're going to live far away from both of them, or you're going to live next to one and not the other. Um, it's kind of the nature of our culture at this point. And so that's, there's, I don't know that there's just one quick answer. There's going to be discernment that needs to be taking place. Jacob.
Sure. I, I mean, part of, I mean, you alluded to the New Testament. That a lot, lot changes in the New Testament with Jesus. I mean, he becomes the corporate personality that we're all part of. And so Paul speaks of, um, you know, different uh, people being his sons and daughters, like different communities, you know, uh, different individuals. And so in a certain sense, um, especially you being the principal of the school, you have a certain kind of role of authority in that person's life. I would say you have every right by virtue of your baptism to offer blessing. And I would actually encourage it. Um, if that child doesn't have it in their home, you're going to be the only person that does. And so um, because the corporate personality now is Christ, um, when you speak blessing on that child, it's Christ speaking blessing on the child. When I speak blessing on my daughter, it's not the blessing of Rich Bud. It's the blessing of Jesus Christ um, that's exercised through me. Um, now, do, do you completely replace what the parents can offer? No, obviously not. But um, you give the child, uh, you, you're feeding a starving child, basically. And so I think you have every right and, and every uh, ability to be able to speak blessing unto that child in that circumstance because of Jesus Christ. All right. I can remember as a child uh, listening to now Saint John Paul II speak on freedom. And I remember him talking about his definition of freedom the ability to do good. Mm -hmm. And I remember as a child going, that's not freedom. Freedom is the ability to do what I want. And I point this out because I had grabbed onto this American. The first thing I would say is that the freedom is actually both. Um, the, 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 what you identified as kind of the American definition of freedom to do what I want, that's the prerequisite to be able to grow in virtue. So um, if you're trying to like instill the proper understanding of freedom in your child, don't say it's not doing what you want because they'll be like, well, wait a minute. You know, like something in them is going to kind of rebel again. So I would say it, it is that, but the first sense of freedom is for the second sense, for the freedom for excellence, right? Actually, it's, it's funny that you bring that up because we just went over that in RCIA, that this is the foundation of morality, that uh, morality exists so that you can live the fullness of who you are um, and that's the truest sense of freedom. So when I sit down to play Beethoven on the piano, all you're going to hear is banging and clanging on the piano because I haven't, I haven't submitted myself to the laws uh, of music and I haven't conformed my body to the practice of the piano. So I'm not free to play um, Beethoven. Um, but to, to answer the second part of your question, this is, this is, this is the challenge. Um, we can't escape our culture because we are connected to it. it we're, the, the corporate soul here, it, it's applicable. Um, it's not just a notional thing that we pick up. We, it's in the ether and, and it becomes part of like what we kind of act out of. And so it's going to be, there's not going to be a moment where you're just like, got it. No, I'm no longer acting like an American, you know. I mean, even if you, like, move to China and spend the rest of your life there, you will become more Chinese, but you're never going to give up your Americanism. So, um, 
so that I would I would hesitate to say that there's like a path to like moving out of that. Um, but you can grow continually, you know, aware through through self reflection and things like the examine that Saint Ignatius of of um, Loyola. I was going to say Antioch, but he was one of the church fathers um, of Loyola taught that. You know, you do an examine of, uh, in the beginning of the morning. You stop in the middle of your day and you think about, okay, where am I at, you know, throughout the morning. Before you go to bed, you do the same thing. You get in the practice of being aware of what's going on in your own heart and in your own mind so that when those kind of reactions come up, they're not just part of your instinct and reaction. You're, you become more aware of them and you can start to choose to redirect your mind and your heart in a different direction raising kids in that way. I mean, the number one thing is to just kind of do it yourself and let them learn from you. Um, but then just, you know, in talking with them, you've got to be able to explain just kind of what you were explaining now, that there's a different sense of freedom here um, that you've got to be able to uh, incorporate into your life. Um, I don't know if that made any sense or not, but uh, I think, I, th I, I, I don't think we give enough uh, credit to just reflection, being, being reflective people and thinking about our lives and, and what's going on interiorly and then making d choices and decisions to before or against those things. So I think it, that can go a long way. Jeremy. Jeez, Jeremy. Um, <laughs> all right, the, the, the first question, like the, the path of marriage. Um, John Paul II says, his, his exhortation to families is, become what you are. So there's this sense that your, your wedding is what happens on a, on a day, and everything of marriage is present at that moment. But you as an individual need to grow into that um, and, and perfect it in your own life. And so this is where we get like the, the order of marriage. It's, it's connecting us to marriages 
throughout the church and throughout the, uni- the universal church. Um, but I need to make, and, and the ultimate marriage of Christ and the church, I need to make the marriage of Christ and the church present in my own life. How? Um, I need to imitate Christ. Actually, this um, icon of Christ that I put up, I chose it specifically. The yeah, the, this, the name of this icon is Christ the Bridegroom. And so, how does Christ live out his being husband? He gets up on the cross. You know, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is Second Philippians. Jesus did not deem equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of the slave. Uh, so, uh, and, and, um, and then I just blanked when I was trying to say my, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Uh, but this idea of we have, through baptism, taken on the life of Jesus. We're living the life of Jesus. Marriage is a specific route of living the life of Jesus. What does that mean? I have to empty myself. Marriage is not about me being satisfied with, um, you know, having a community about me. Marriage is how I'm going to grow in my holiness by dying on the cross. I mean, that's essentially what it is. Now, if anybody in here is engaged, get married. It's great. Uh, (laughs) But essentially, that's what the path of marriage is. It's growing into being the man of the cross or the woman of the cross. Um, And so that's the path. Um, It's always going to be this purification of my own desire, my purification of my own pride, you know, um, envy, sloth, you know, name all seven deadly sins. Um, Second question, what was it? Marriage prep. Oh, well, the way that we're looking at it in the Diocese of Lansing is that marriage, again, marriage has this larger connection to what it means to be the church. And so if a couple comes to us and they don't even have a relationship with Jesus Christ, they can't do this. I mean, (laughs) this is like light years away. So the very first thing that we have to do is introduce them to who Jesus is. Um, So we're looking at ways in which the first step of marriage prep will be to do some sort of uh, charismatic event where they, they hear the gospel and they're, conv- you know, they're invited to um, let Jesus be the, the Lord of their life. You know? um, out of that, then you can start to do marriage preparation proper. But if you don't start with a relationship with Jesus, none of this then makes sense. So there's very practical things that you have to do in marriage prep just because you're living with a human being. You know, you've got to learn to communicate better and you've got to learn to balance your checkbook properly and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but there's also, like, you have to understand what marriage is. And so when you go at your nuptial mass and you say that I accept all three of these promises, you have to have spent some time reflecting on what those promises are. Um, and, and so what we're trying to do is, is improve the methods of, of that instruction, but also provide times for the couple to be able to meditate on what they're doing and what, they're, what they've learned. Um, but you also have, because we exist in this larger entity, the corporate soul of the whole church, um, and we're trying to fight against isolation, um, we need to do better at mentoring and just befriending. It's not that complicated. Remember what Cardinal Ratzinger said, the answer is holiness, it's not a program, and so we just have to connect our young couples with holy mentors and, and, and kind of let them do that spiritual generation that I mentioned at the end. So in some ways, it's not that hard. It's, it's being human beings. Um, but in other sense, I mean, there's gotta be some reflection to it. I mean, but Jesus Christ is always the answer. So we need to find better ways of getting him in the, in the, in the situation. So. Thank you.